Dr. Mindy here, and on this video, I'm gonna to explain to you fatty liver. And now what I want you to understand is there's a spectrum of fatty liver challenges. So even if you're like, I don't think I have a fatty liver, I want you to listen carefully as I go through this because the fatty liver disease builds and it takes 10, 20, 30 years for it to, to uh, hit its peak where you actually have to do something about it. So I'm gonna break this all down. I'm gonna talk about what fatty liver is. I'm gonna talk about signs that will give you an indication that you may be building it. And most importantly, I'm gonna talk about what you can do about it. And if you are new to my channel, I just wanna say welcome. I am a woman on a mission to get the world fasting, get the world healthy. And when we look at some of the statistics on fatty liver, it's pretty startling how many people are dealing with fatty liver disease. So I'm really excited that you're here. Okay, here's the deal. We have 25% of the world's population has a fatty liver problem. The first question I want you to think of whenever you see a big statistic like this is what is the world doing? What is everybody doing that's contributing to fatty liver disease? And here's the thing, is it's diet. So fatty liver disease can happen from too much sugar, it can happen from too much alcohol, and it can happen from too many bad fats. So make sure that you're bringing your sugar load down, you're bringing your alcohol level down, and you know the difference between a good fat and a bad fat. I am a huge fan of good fats. I think we should be powering up on good fats. I am not a fan of bad fats. So if you are eating a lot of inflammatory oils, please let's look at that as also being a culprit of fatty liver disease. Now, how do you know you have it? Because here's the thing about a progression of a disease is that when a disease starts, it doesn't always give you big red flag signs. Sometimes disease starts slowly building and you have no idea. So here are some of the ways you know that a fatty liver is building in your body. So first, your blood glucose goes up. So this might look like you're looking at your, your meter in the morning or you're wearing a CGM and you're like scratching your head and you're like, why is my blood sugar not going down? We also see it in other metabolic markers. We see it in hemoglobin A1C. You want your hemoglobin A1C on a traditional blood test to be five or below. If your hemoglobin A1C is higher than that, there's a chance you're building fatty liver disease. We also know that when CRP goes up, when total cholesterol, LDLs go up, triglycerides go up, those are all signs that we are starting to build fat around the liver. Now remember, that fat is where your body stores excess. So it doesn't matter if it's around your belly, back of your arms, on your hips, or in your liver, that fat is where the body is gonna go put extra storage, extra stuff. So fatty liver is just a st extra storage of all those sugar, all the toxins, all the alcohol, all that gets stored there. The crazy thing about a fatty liver, by the way, is that you may not see it in the mirror. You might be skinny. We call that skinny fat, where you like look in the mirror and you're like, I can eat anything I want. I look amazing. But in reality, your high sugar, high fat, high alcohol, high toxin diet is getting stored around your liver. And you will see that on a blood test. So second thing I want you to think about with fatty liver disease and how you would know you have it is we start to see people getting pain in the upper right corner of, the, of their abdomen. This is where your liver lives. So if you're all of a sudden getting mystery pain up there, go get a blood test and look at those markers I just talked about. Okay, the other th way that you would know that you've got some fat accumulated around this liver is when you are fasting and you're not seeing your blood sugar come down. Okay, this is a big one because I know a lot of you have this issue where the blood sugar is not coming down and you're like, I'm doing everything I possibly can. Well, that could be because the liver is congested. Your past behaviors from years ago has the liver not really working out the way or working the way that you want it. So when the blood sugar is not coming down, that's a sign. Another sign, eesh, I know you guys, 
ask me this a lot is if you're having trouble getting into ketosis it could be a sign that that liver is just stagnant it's got too much fat around it too many toxins so you're going to want to fast more because fasting will start to wring those toxins wring that sugar out of the liver another thing is detox reactions so those of you when you go and you start to do the ketogenic diet when you start to fast if you're getting strong detox reactions, brain fog, rashes, constipation, that can be a fatty liver, a sign of a fatty liver. And then the last sign, and I'm gonna throw this out there to the women, is that if you run a Dutch test, which is my favorite hormone test, it will show you if your liver is metabolizing hormones or not. Remember that the metabolizing of hormones is a breaking those hormones down and that happens in the liver. And sometimes, especially as we go through perimenopause and menopause, we don't even realize that our diet, our alcohol consumption is affecting how the liver could be breaking down these hormones. A great test, the Dutch test is my favorite test. I think every woman should get a Dutch test every year and you'll be able to see if the liver is supporting hormonal health or not. So just if you, and we run them all the time. We have health coaches that will read them for you. I just did one today. I do them yearly. So I literally just did one today. So just put Dutch test in the comments. My team will send you a link. Okay, here's the most important thing. What can you do about it? There are quick fixes and there are long-term fixes. So here are my quick fixes. Ready? This is my quick fix. It's my quick fix for so many things is fasting. When you go in and out of the longer fast, these are your 17 hour, 24, 36, 48, 72, those longer fasts, you're putting some stress on the liver and forcing that liver to release the, some of the fat. You're forcing it to let go of some of that sugar. So let's do the fasting variation I've been teaching you here on this channel. Okay, second thing that or is a quick fix is get off all of the processed carbs go into only nature's carbs. These are your squashes and potatoes and fruits. Those can be amazing. So those are, that's kind of like today. You can do that today. So remember, undoing the damage that you did decades ago is not impossible. This is why I'm here preaching fasting to you. It's not impossible, but it takes consistency, which is why we want to make sure that you're going in and out of those fasts. Okay. Now, what about more a little like great treatments? Like if you were, you and I were sitting in a consultation and you're like, yeah, I have everything that you just mentioned that is possibly uh, causing a fatty liver, a sign of a fatty liver. And we were sitting there, you were on the other side of this desk. Here's what I'd say. First thing, this is my, one of my favorite, this is a little bit of a quick fix too. Restore Hope Oils. There is a blend of Live Better and Pure Regen. I did a amazing podcast with Gavin, the founder of these oils. Um, I will put a link in the notes here so you can go find that podcast interview. But we know that high quality essential oils rubbed over the liver can start to heal the liver and let the liver release that extra sugar. Second thing I'll tell you, this, whoop, this is my favorite. Um, supplement protocol to start to heal that liver and get it metabolically working for you again. It's called the Metabolic Clearing Kit. It's got great information in there. It is literally a kit that you can implement right away. So if you want the link for that, just put Metabolic Clearing Kit in your notes or in your comments. And the last thing, I haven't talked about this in a while, is the darn castor oil pack. Castor oil pack over that liver at night, something as simple as three times a week can start to heal the liver, can start to release all of that stored sugar and can be truly miraculous. So know that castor oil packs are an incredible tool. If you wanna know the one, just put castor oil pack in the comments. But the liver, it's a big issue when we come to fasting. So remember that if you're not getting the fasting result you want, it's possible that it's something as, as as nuanced as we need to heal your liver more. We need to love on your liver more so that the liver can produce ketones and the liver can really shine with your fasting lifestyle. So as always, I hope that helps. And remember how much I love your comments in the section below. Put your stories about how you've used this information to heal your life. It geeks me out. I love it. Okay. 
So I really want to dive into the liver and specifically I want to talk about nine signs that may indicate that you have fatty liver disease. And there's a lot of reasons why I want to go into this. Um, and, and you'll see as I go through the video what some of those reasons are. But for those of you that are really building yourself an amazing fasting lifestyle, I want you to know that the liver is so important. That is your fat burning organ. That is how you are going to be able to metabolically switch. And if that liver, uh, you've got some non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or you're switching in and out of sugar burner and fat burner could be very difficult. So let's dive in to what these signs are and more importantly, what you can do about it. Okay, first, I really, I, I really want you to get this. I want you to understand that your liver is a fat burning organ. Okay, just think about that for a moment. If you knew that your liver was a fat burning organ, would you treat it differently? Would you take care of it differently? I think we don't give it enough credit. It's one of the hardest working organs in our body. And it's not just alcohol that starts to create inflammation in the liver. It can be diet as well. So we're gonna go through some of those things right now but think of it from this lens it is helping you burn fat let's love on it so it can do that efficiently so the first thing that I want you to think through is that there are some very clear risk factors that are indications that fat is building around your liver I think one of the challenges we have with the human body is if you can't see it you don't tend to know that it's struggling so the liver is one of them by the way if you some of you might be like well where's my liver at it's important to know the anatomy of the liver too it's on the right side of your thoracic cage and if you think about this your ribs the job of the ribs is to protect organs so it's protecting your organ right here on the right side, it's protecting the liver. So when we start to get these risk factors, it can be a sign that that liver is struggling. So let me go through the risk factors first, and then I'm gonna go through these symptoms. So gaining weight. Gaining weight, obesity is one major risk factor to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It makes sense because I want you to remember what is happening when you're gaining weight. So let's take a really classic classic scenario that we see a lot in, in the Western world, which is a highly refined processed diet, High refined carbohydrates, refined sugars and flours, bad oils. What happens is your, your human body doesn't know how, what to do with all of those foods. Those are man-made foods. They didn't come from nature. And so your body doesn't know what to do with them. And the more you're eating the cakes, the pastas, and this is like the highly refined, not all pastas like this, but the cakes, the cookies, the desserts, the bad oils, the sodas, the more you're eating that, the more the body's going to store it as fat. So when we hit a place where we are obese or we're holding on to a large amount of weight, you can see that weight by looking in the mirror. And what I want you to realize is that the weight isn't just on your torso or on your hips or around your face. The, or in your midsection, the weight is also gathering. That fat is also gathering in your liver. So obesity is an is definite risk factor. Other risk factors are very much in alignment with poor metabolic health. Diabetes is a risk factor. High blood pressure is a, a risk factor. Uh, high cholesterol. When you walk into your doctor's office and you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and you're obese and you're pre-diabetic, you can guess that there's also fat accumulating accumulating around the liver. And then of course, insulin resistance, which is a precursor to all those that I just talked about. So with that out of the way, what do we need to know about symptom? And here's what's really tricky about the liver is that, and fatty liver disease, is that most symptoms go undetected. And so you can go years and years and years with your liver being destroyed by too much of the Western diet, and you don't even realize it's affecting your liver. You might be looking in the mirror, you might be frustrated with the fact that you can't lose weight, but you're not thinking about your liver, you're more frustrated because you want to drop weight. Or maybe you walk into your doctor's office, they look at your blood work, they're like, we're concerned about the markers I just said. And so again, the liver is sort of the last thing that we think about. And 
What is really great about the liver is you only need 20% of your liver to be functioning for the liver to do its job. Now, we don't want to get so much fat around the liver. We don't want to get so much inflammation that causes a lot of scarring on the liver so that it actually has to be forced into um, functioning at its best with this 20% left. But I bring that to you because my concern is that it can take years and by the time symptoms show up, you're in a bad spot. And you know, I, I, I've had several patients over the years that have had to go into the arduous um, process of waiting for a liver transplant, not a fun experience that anybody wants. So being able to identify the symptoms that I'm about to give you and knowing eesh, that could be a problem, my liver could be struggling, will be very helpful, I promise, and it will save your life. So here are the symptoms. First is abdominal pain or a feeling of fullness in the upper right part of your abdomen. So remember, the liver is right here on the upper right part of your abdomen. When you have pain in this area, there are, that is a sign that we have moved into a dangerous place with fatty liver disease. We also start to see muscle weakness. So muscle weakness because as the liver shuts down, it can't detoxify as well. And if it can't detoxify, then toxins start to build up and toxins love mitochondria. And you have a tremendous amount of mitochondria in your muscles. So it, fatigue in those muscles could be a sign that the liver is saying, hey, help me, I need, I need some help and support here. I'm not able to detoxify everything in your body properly. We also see some, some digestive symptoms like loss of appetite is one, or nausea, that chronic nausea. Especially when we're looking at these symptoms, when we're looking at this and you have several of them, I just, again, lovingly want to remind you that it's time to really move into action. I'm going to give you the action here in a moment. So nausea, loss of appetite, sometimes people losing weight for no particular reason could be the liver struggling. Yellowing of skin. So how many times do you look at your skin? skin color, like to, like look in the mirror. I, I do this a lot. Like I'm always observing even my hands or when I look in the mirror in the morning, like how does my skin look? Does it look whiter than normal? Does it look yellow? Um, there's even something really interesting where the inner part of your eye can get yellow when the liver is struggling. So a yellow tinge to your skin, to that inner part of the eye, that can be a sign that really early sign that your liver is in overload. And then the last two that are really interesting are fatigue and mental confusion. Again, for all the same reasons that I've been discussing, once that liver starts saying, hey, hey, I'm struggling over here, help me, we start to see that the body cannot have, the, will not have that same level of energy and inflammation starts to happen in the mind, toxins can get into the brain, and now you have mental confusion. So when you look at those nine, some of you might have multiple ones. I'm not, this is not like, oh, all of a sudden I randomly started losing weight for no particular reason, I must have fatty liver disease. This is more like, hey, we might start to see some metabolic changes on blood work that are a little concerning, but maybe we have diabetes in the family. But then we mix that with, gosh, my skin's looking a little yellow. There's a little bit of a yellow tinge in my in the middle of my eye mixed with I am a little bit nauseous. Every once in a while I get some pain in my upper right quadrant. The symptoms will be subtle. And that's why I want to explain that sometimes they can be multiple symptoms, but they're subtle. And we have a tendency to just label everything in this genetic or this aging category. And that's what I don't want you to do. I want you to look at those symptoms and I want you to take action. And here's the f action I want you to take. And there's some really good ways to take action. First, what do you think I'm gonna say? Fasting. Okay, so there is some really interesting research done on fasting and fatty liver disease. So there's a 2023 study, very current, that found being in a calorie deficit can not only um, help you lose weight, but it extends the time that your body is burning energy from fat around the liver. Okay, check this out. I have a free fasting guide for you all. It's free. 
and it's going to teach you all the basics of fasting. It's going to teach you how to kill hunger when you fast, which is really cool. And it's going to show you how to break your fast, among many other things. All you got to do is click on this link right here and enjoy. Okay, so think about this for a moment. When in Fast Like a Girl, I talked about how we had six different length fasts. Okay, the, remember, they're time dependent. So if you go into a 15-hour fast and you're feeling good and you're losing weight and your hunger's down, okay, great, there's liver healing there. But what if you stay there longer? What if you went 17 hours? What if you went 24 hours? What if you went just a little bit longer? The deeper you go, the longer period of time, your body is so smart that it's going to go and find the fat it's stored around the liver. So my number one solution is fasting and going into some of those longer fasts. Number two, and stay, I got some fun ones here. Number two solution is to avoid alcohol. And the reason that I want to put this in here, I know it's kind of the obvious one, which is, you know, like alcohol damages liver. Most people know that. But what I want you to understand is that when you drink alcohol, even if it's a glass of wine at night, in the moment that your liver has to process that alcohol, it's not burning fat. So those of you that are trying to lose weight and you're really frustrated and you're having your glass out of wine every single night, you might need to get up, give the glass of wine up so that you give your liver longer periods of time to burn fat for you. So, so alcohol for sure makes not even non-alcoholic fatty liver disease worse. Okay, another one. Love this one. Drinking coffee. So a 2021, and check this out, I found this study, and all these studies I'm, I'll put in the notes here for you science hounds that want to look at this. So a 2021 study found that drinking coffee decreased your risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and could stop it from progressing into more severe stages. Now, they think, the study thinks that possibly that's because of the high antioxidants in coffee. Now, this doesn't mean you run off to your local coffee store. I am still going to stay tr true to the fact that anytime we put food or drink in our mouth, it needs to have the cleanest ingredients possible. So make sure you're getting organic coffee. If you can get it mold free, that's great. But you, this is not a, a trip down to your favorite coffee store that is franchised all over the world. I won't say the name, but Though there's a lot of chemicals in those. So let's eat, let's do clean coffee. Now, I, I know what you're gonna ask me. You're gonna ask me how many cups of coffee? Well, let me answer that, because that's exciting as well. So, doctors at the University of Chicago, this is a study, we're gonna put it in the notes, so, suggest that two to three cups of coffee a day can help with stopping the progression or preventing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's cool. Okay, next tip is exercise. Okay, I know, I know you're like, well, I don't like to exercise. Okay, well, good news. A 2023 study, check this out, found that 2.5 hours a week, 2.5 hours a week of moderate exercise. So this could be going for a walk. If you split that into a half an hour walk every single day, you're gonna far surpass past your 2.5 hours of physical activity. And what the exercise one is really cool because you know what it did? You know how coffee prevented it from getting worse? What exercise did is it reversed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So lifestyle, we're back at lifestyle. When you're given a scary diagnosis, the first thing I always want you to think is what lifestyle do I need to make sure that I am building health and that is reversing the scary diagnosis. Let's always go to lifestyle first. What's happening and what we've gotten so our comfort creature, you know, part of us is like, give me the pill, give me the surgery, make a go away now. When we come to lifestyle to heal ourselves, like fasting and exercise and avoiding alcohol and um, drinking coffee, it's not like you're gonna drink one cup of coffee and your liver is gonna be like, thank you, I'm now healed. It ha we have to do these things repetitively. It takes work, it takes effort, it takes responsibility on your part, but the, the, what's the other solution? So when we're looking at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I want you to think about the risk factors that I talked about. I want you to think about the nine signs that I've given you here. And then I want you to start to build a fasting lifestyle. If you don't know how to do that, and by the way, men are buying this book too. So the first section is all on fasting. You don't have to be a woman to read it. So let's think about fasting, coffee, exercise, avoiding alcohol, and let's do it repetitively. 
So you got this. So if you're listening to this, you're concerned, I want you to know I'm cheering you on. You've got this. Your body's miraculous. The liver knows how to regenerate, regenerate itself. It only needs 20% to do that. So don't give up on yourself. Okay, put in the notes. If you've used any of those tricks to reverse fatty liver disease. Okay, Dr. Mindy here, and you guys asked, so I am delivering. You wanted to know how do you open up your liver detox pathways? So on this video, I go through seven things you can do, everything from free things all the way up to things that cost a little bit of money. So I put it in descending order, order so that you guys can step into opening up your pathways very easily. So get ready. We're gonna talk about the liver and we're gonna help you improve the function of that organ so you can thrive with your fasting lifestyle. Okay, let's talk about opening up your detox pathway in your liver, okay? So go back and watch the video that I did um, on if you're struggling with fasting, it may be closed pathways. You have a lot of different pathways. We, I went through that in, the, in that video. But on this video, I wanna talk specifically about your liver and what you can do to open up your liver pathways. So I have seven things. I'm gonna throw in a little bonus eighth thing. Um, and I'm gonna read through them in descending order of like what's, like what's the easiest all the way up to the most complicated, okay? So how the heck do we start to heal this liver that is working so hard to detoxify you? So first thing, make sure you're hydrated. I know we got a lot, a lot of fasting fans here on this channel. A lot of you love dry fasting um, and that's a whole separate conversation. But for opening up the liver pathway, you want to make sure that you're hydrated. That is really crucial. And of course, with clean water, it would be the best, clean filtered water. So the first one, make sure you're drinking enough water, especially when you're fasting. Okay, second thing, up your vegetables, specifically cruciferous vegetables. So you have a microbiome in your gut, you have a microbiome around your liver, you've got a microbiome in the common bile duct where the liver will actually exit or push the toxins out of it. And there's a microbiome in all of that area and it needs you to start to feed these good bacteria vegetables. So a lot of times we see with you guys that are fasting a lot, you love the one meal a day, you get, you get stuck in the one meal a day, um, but in that one meal, you're so low keto that you're not getting enough vegetables. So I recommend when we go to like spend some dedicated time to open up the liver pathway that you get somewhere around nine cups of vegetables a day. That's what the microbiome of both the gut and the liver will need. Cruciferous vegetables are the best. So Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, those are fabulous for not just opening up the, the liver pathway, but it increases your glutathione levels, which allows the liver to detoxify better. Okay, so that's number two. Third thing you can do is castor oil packs. So this is actually a pretty easy thing to do. So you get some castor oil at the market, you get like a, a organic cloth and you pour the castor oil on the cloth you're gonna put the, the castor oil on your liver and then you get a warm water bottle. Um, I'm gonna put an article in here, a, a link where you can learn how to do it. I'll link some studies that are really interesting about castor oil. But when you put a warm bottle, bottle on top of the castor oil flannel and you drive in the castor oil into the liver, what research is showing that is that it can not only decongest the pathways coming out of the liver and open all of that up, but it, it increases lymphocytes. It can help you convert T4 into T3. So those of you that have thyroid problems, and it's particularly healing for fatty liver syndrome. So easy to do. And again, I'll link a how-to in the notes of this video, okay? Now we're on to the fourth thing. So fourth thing, I've talked about this before. It's called a bile push. And a bile push is activated charcoal. Our favorite is bind. This is what we use. And what we have our patients do is they do two bind, then they eat a ton of fat. So you can eat an avocado, nut butter. There's a lot of different things that you can, um, fats that you can eat, ghee, um, and you just want a mega dose on fat. And so you're gonna end up with, you have, you're gonna have your two bind, and then you're gonna uh, eat your big bowl of fat, and then a half an hour later, you're gonna do two bind again, 
Okay, that's called a bile push. Okay, the fifth one, I told you I was gonna go through in levels of complication. So now we're moving to a little more complicated ways to open up these, these pathways, but incredibly effective. So you guys have heard me hopefully talk about coffee enemas. We're gonna talk about that in the, in the next step. But before that, a lot of people will do a suppository called Xenoplex. You can find it on Amazon, we'll put it in the link. Xenoplex can, it, it can actually start to get through the lower intestinal tract. It gets, it, it will cause dilation of the lower intestinal tract up into the common bile duct, up into the liver. It's got caffeine in it, so it will dilate those pathways so that the common bile duct can get all the uh, toxins out and it will open up and start to dilate the um, cells of the liver. Okay, so Xenoplex. It's kind of, you know, when people, when I talk to people about coffee enemas and they're like, yeah, I'm not really excited about that. I tell them do a bile push, then do Xenoplex. And then if you feel like your pathways are still closed, then you're gonna need to jump into my sixth thing, which is coffee enemas. So there is, coffee enemas are game changers for you that are trying to detox. If you guys are struggling to bring your blood sugar down, if you're struggling to get into ketosis, I promise you the coffee enema is most likely the cure. Because with all of that caffeine, what happens is there's so much dilation that can occur in the liver, so much dilation that can occur in the, in the common bile duct that it'll just start to filter out everything that the liver is trying to push out of it. And it'll push it into the small intestine and out through your colon. We do have uh, instructions on how to do coffee enemas. So if you want those instructions, just put coffee enema in the comments and we'll make sure you get those. Okay, that was number six. Okay, now we're gonna dive into biohacks. So there are some really cool biohacks that you can do. Um, things like infrared sauna is amazing because you're gonna heat the cells of the liver up from the inside out. You can't do this in a gym sauna. You can't do this any other way. So we love infrared sauna for opening up the liver. And then the last thing is if you're like, I've been doing all that and I just feel like my liver is struggling. It's called L-Liver. It's a supplement that is specifically made to get nutrients back to your liver. So remember, your liver is the hardest working organ in your body, and it's, we live in the most toxic time in human history. So this poor organ is working so much that sometimes it just needs a little help. So you can go through the list I just gave you and really focus on opening up the pathways, and sometimes the liver just needs good old-fashioned supplements to really help support it. Cruciferous vegetables are great at supporting the nutrients for the liver, but there's nothing like L-liver. We have found this to be a game changer for people who are going through our detox protocols. So there's your liver, okay? So if you guys are fasting and you're getting a lot of rashes, your blood sugar and ketones aren't where you want them to be, um, you're getting bloated, maybe you're getting um, holding on to weight and you don't understand why, I want you to walk through those steps that I just gave you and ask yourself, am I doing each one? And I usually say start with the hydration, that's easy, move to the vegetables, then do the castor oil, then, if, then you can bring in the bile push, the xenoplex, the coffee enemas, the biohacks, the supplements. So it really is a good list for you guys to follow there. Um, but fasting works, it really works. And if you're struggling with it, it may be as simple as you just need to open up your liver pathways. Instead of women potentially seeing how frustrating it is, yeah. you can almost flip this and it can be empowering to know, wait a minute, I'm in tune with my body here. Yeah right? In this week, it's not that I'm a failure, that I can't do those six Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. I'm actually taking control again. No, you know, I'm honoring my body by only doing three or four. And it, there, was, there was something in your book, which I underlined again, which I found really, really powerful. I, I definitely want to talk later on about the foods that support mm -hmm. our hormones. But there was something in the book. Oh, here it was. You put this. The beauty of being a woman is that there is nothing simple about your body. No. And, and I, I, I really paused when I read that because I thought Mindy's 
completely reframing the way many people, many women, I think, view Mm -hmm. the frustration of their hormones not playing ball in their 30s and 40s. You're kind of saying throughout the book that, hold on, that's your superpower. Women's hormones are their superpower. The reason you don't like them is because you've not learned how to harness them. Oh, so well said. That is so well said. So I, you know, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is the fact that there are the number one like driver for the human body is to stay alive, right? We, I think we talked about this last time is that we were always, our body's always thinking survival, 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 which is why stress shuts down so many important mechanisms in the body because the body is like trying to run from a tiger. But for a woman's body, We have survival and we have a number two priority and that's reproduction. So whether we're aware of it or not, we have these hormones that are coming in so that we can continue the species on so that we can procreate. And I'm not saying that every, this is not like every woman needs to have a child. I'm saying that your body was built to have a child, child, whether you have one or not. And those hormones have to be minded and nobody has taught you how to take care of them. So when we look at survival, this one's really interesting to me. The reason many times people can't lose weight is because they're so stressed out. And well, if you're stressed out, the body doesn't care about losing weight. The body wants to get away from the tiger. Okay, same thing. If you if you are so stressed out, your body's like, we're not making a baby right now. We're running from a tiger. And every single hormonal system now goes off. And that's what we have to take back as women is we have to say, okay, I was programmed for survival. I was programmed for reproduction. How do I work with that? Mm-hmm. And that's a really simplistic, but very clear way yeah. of thinking about things, isn't it? Yeah. And, that, and you guys don't have to think about that as much. You know, the, the, your hormones don't demand that. So whereas we're, because we're, ca- we, we're carrying the baby. So we have, there's a lot more plumbing that has to go with growing and carrying a baby. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times in my career I've had a female, let's say in their 30s, who is struggling to get pregnant. And Again, of course, there can be many different causes of that. Mm -hmm. But I would see so often if you could help that woman slow down. I remember one case, really driven, highly successful woman in her early 30s who would go to the gym every morning at 5 a.m. before work and she'd be crushing it at work. And I remember saying, hey, listen, I think your body is constantly wired and you're in a chronic stress state, a chronic go, go, go state. And I just don't feel that your body is in a position where it actually wants to just go, yeah, I can release an egg now. I, you know, you can get pregnant. Yeah. And I, I said, would you be interested in not going to the gym? Could I persuade you to, as a trial, not go to the gym for four weeks? She said, do you think it'll make a difference? I said, look, I honestly don't know, but all your tests are clear. And this is the sense I'm getting from you. And literally a few weeks later, from stopping going to the gym, she got pregnant. Yeah. And again, that's an N equals one, right? It's not a scientific yeah. study, yeah. but I have seen that so many times. So many times. So one, as once I started to really understand hormones, I was like, there, there are, there are so many lifestyle tools that we need to map to our hormones, exercise being one of them. So I uh, got to know Tony Horton. Do you know Tony Horton? I don't think I do. P- P90X. He did a oh, whole yeah, okay, online. Okay. So he was like a fitness guru. So I got to know him and I asked him, I was like, have you ever mapped out? Like, why does, why do women have a weekly workout schedule? We should have a monthly workout schedule. And he's like, oh, tell me more. So I broke it down each part of the cycle. Like I have, a, I have a really strong theory that when testosterone comes in during ovulation, women should be lifting heavy weights because you have all that testosterone there to build muscle. So we mapped out a whole program and um, we actually put it out. It just was released. It's called PS, uh, PowerSync 60. Oh my God. And it has a woman's calendar for her monthly calendar. So that shows where you can do harder workouts in the beginning, more weightlifting in the, in the middle. And at the end, there's more recovery. And I hope this starts a trend. Let's just talk about exercise then in the context of the woman's cycle. So first of all, if, if someone is struggling, they don't know where they are in their cycle because they're not having a period. 
What do you say to those women, first of all? It's the hardest one. It's so hard. And I think I think we talked about this last time. It, it really, the best map is the moon cycle. And the, the, the logic behind that is that if we didn't have all this blue light, most women would be cycling together. But we have so much blue light that's affecting our the back at the light thing, right? Of throwing off our hormones that we're all cycling different. But if you looked at the moon, many experts believe that the new moon would be the first day of our period and the full moon would be during ovulation. And so, in fact, um, really interesting story. I was on the island of Kauai recently, and we had a yoga instructor that was working with my friend and I, and she and she also was a surfer. And she said, do you know that all the women on the North Shore, she's like all the, she owned a yoga studio. She's like, all the women I know here on the North Shore cycle together. And I'm like, why, why do you cycle together? And she's like, I think it's because we're outside so much. They were surfers. It's a, a mm. very outdoor island. And my theory on that is they are actually seeing more of the moon and maybe even being in the water, the tide's changing. But why would you see a group of women? Now, this is a story. We don't have science on this. But why would you see a group of women cycling together that are all outdoors in this island yeah. together? We are connected to nature. So to your point, we would use the moon if we didn't have a cycle to be able to try it, that. It is so interesting. Do we know, for example, with other... Uh, people who are outside a lot, let's say hunter-gatherer tribes, do we know if the women there cycle together? We read about things like red tents where the women go and they rest yeah. during their period. That's right. And, you know, the rest of the tribe are doing all the work. Yeah. They're allowed to just nourish themselves, I guess, for four or five days. Th that, I would love to know that. I And that will be somewhere along my, my research. I want to go look at other cultures mm. and see what are they doing and how are they managing this? Um, what are the infertility rates? I think that's the first place to start mm. is look at the infertility rates of by different countries. And then maybe we could dial down and see, okay, why does this country not have such high infertility rates? And then we could dial down and see, okay, what is she doing with her lifestyle? Yeah. That's what's needed right now. You also hear of women saying that when they're sharing a flat with other women, they start to have their menstrual cycle at the yeah. same time. You know, I've heard that many, many times. Is that something that's come up for you? Yeah, definitely. And oh, in my office was for sure, you know, we were tons of women in an office together. Always we would just all sync up with, you know, and every new woman that would come in, a new employee, we'd be like, ah, well, this here's when our cycle is. Yours is probably going to be the same soon. So, yeah, and that's through smell, believe it or not. It's through pheromones that we actually can smell the changes, which is also crazy, right? Mm. Like, how do we smell the changes in each other? It's so subtle and it changes our hormones. If smell of another woman in her cycle can change your hormones, imagine what, you know, the toxic beauty product you're using or the amount of stress you're doing is doing to your hormones. This is why we have to bring hormone literacy back to women. It's so nuanced. Uh, and it's about getting back in touch with our bodies. Yeah. We're talking about women here, but for men as well, like I feel that we've lost touch with ourselves. We're, we're constantly looking to external experts for advice and expertise on our own bodies. And I say to people, look, listen to what people yeah. say, listen to what I'm saying or what Mindy's saying, but then kind of listen to yourself. Go, yeah. is that applicable to me? Does yeah. that work for me? Yep. Do I agree with that for me in my life? Agreed. And I, I do feel that your whole work, which on the surface is about empowering women about their hormones, it's actually much bigger than that. Yeah. It's about empowering women to know themselves better, to trust themselves better, and to lean into that. Yeah, it, thank you. That's exactly, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, people often say, oh, you're the fasting expert. And it's fine. You call me whatever you want to call me. But in my heart, if you were to crawl in my heart and ask me what I really am trying to do is I'm trying to give women their power back. And fasting was the first step and teaching women how to fast and eat according to their cycle. But now we need to continue the discussion into what are all the intricacies of our hormones? What do I need to learn okay. how to do? So let's talk about exercise then. I think we all know that exercise is important. So let's say on a 
on a typical, which is not even that typical anymore, 28-day cycle, just maybe give us a recap again of those three phases. And then if you could explain what kinds of exercise you think are most beneficial at each stage. Yeah. Oh, it's it's. This is also a really good nugget for people to take. So real quickly, day one is the day you start your period. So many women don't even know what day one is. So day one is when you actually need to use feminine care products. Okay. So spotting is not day one. And there, a lot of women have spotting and we can chat about that. But day one is when you start your period. So from day one to day 10, you're, you're going to start to build estrogen. And the characteristics of, her, of estrogen are vast. I mean, she is going to give you great mental clarity. Ask any menopausal woman who's lost estrogen. She is typically makes your hair really full and your skin, you know, very moist. She gives you great ability to access both sides of your brain. So you can access both the right and the left side of your brain. So you're very, not only creative, but you're very articulate. Mm. We have, this makes us, many of us, verbal processors. And she's building, building, building from day one to day 10. She peaks during ovulation. So at day 10, 11 to day 15, we now have estrogen at her glory. And then boop, you get a little blip of testosterone. And testosterone comes in and testosterone is going to be motivation and drive. It's going to be your libido. Testosterone doesn't typically have a food, like I can't tell you I would eat these foods for testosterone. But I, when we get to exercise, you'll see that I really want women to use testosterone to build muscle because that's crazy important. But we always think of testosterone as libido, but it's not really libido. It's it's also your motivation and drive to, to, to get something accomplished. And then we get a little bit of progesterone that calms us. So in the book, I called that the manifestation phase. That, that's eleven to day 11 to 15. Yeah. So day one to 10, you call- The power phase. The power phase. Day 11 to 15, the manifestation yes. phase. So yeah. the, And during that phase, the woman is ovulating, yes. and releasing the egg. Yeah. I also read a study yesterday. Check this out. This is how brilliant we are. You get right before a release of an egg, you get a surge of oxytocin. The body as estradiol peaks- and an egg is about to be released, you get a surge, a woman will get a surge of oxytocin. Okay, why would the body do that? Because oxytocin makes us want to connect. Mm. So now all of a sudden I have oxytocin is going to make me want to connect with my partner, which is going to help, again, reproduce the species. Again, coming back to your previous points, there are two main goals for a woman or the body, biologically, I should say. Yeah. Survival. And reproduction. That's right. So understanding how to harness that yeah. is really, really important. And so when you look at this manifestation phase, I still, I'm, I'm some CEO out there is going to hear this, somebody in a corporation, I feel like you could take all the ovulating women, put them in a room and let them create because we ha are wickedly powerful. That's why I called it manifestation. We are locked and loaded with these hormones. So if you want to start a new project, if you want to paint, if you want to create something in your life, if you want to even start a workout plan, do it during ovulation because you have so many hormones. That's not the time for rest and recovery. That's the time to pull out, you know, women's empowerment card and mm. do everything you want to do because you're so hormonally locked and loaded at that moment. Yeah. Okay. So you've gone power phase, manifestation phase, days 11 to 15. Yep. Then you go back to the power phase for a few days, don't you? Yeah, because you get a crash after ovulation. You get this crash of hormones. So I called it another power phase. And I gave them all names because nobody can remember follicular and luteal. And so it was like, let's make, let's have a game out yeah. of this. Let's have some fun with this. No, I, I love that you do that yeah. because I think you were really fantastic communicator. Mm, thank you. And you really want to empower women and using these terms, I think for many, yeah. I think connects and lands better yeah. than these kind of dry follicular luteal phases that That's right. I think scientists have used for, for many years. Yeah. Yeah. So power, when you think power, power is what you can power up on all your health habits. Mm. So you can do, you know, work out hard. You can fast hard. You can stay up late. Like those you can power up and you're going to be fine. Um, you also have power, 
So you can actually, hormones are a little bit lower. Um, in the first power phase, you're building estrogen that really helps with, with the mind, can, what you are able to do with your mind. But there's a lot more you can accomplish in those phases. Manifestation, okay, now we want to create. Now we want to bring, you know, some new project. We want to solve some problem. Mm -hmm. I think you and I talked about this, that I really am encouraging um, people, if you have conflict to resolve with, with a woman, do it during the manifestation phase. She is locked and loaded with all of these hormones. She has all these hormones. She wants to sit down. She can verbally process with you. She's got progesterone, so she's going to be a little calmer. And she's got testosterone, so she's motivated to talk to you. Mm. Don't do it the week before her period. Don't, th like, you know, we can go into that in a moment. But w if we understood hormones, we would even understand better ways to communicate with us. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to get to that. So yeah. I think that's super, Sorry, I super just, interesting. I get so excited about if everybody understood this. Yeah. And I think you're right. You know, I, I was thinking about our first conversation for, for weeks and months afterwards, because I think the implications of what you're teaching are so profound. Mm, thank you. And the final phase, yeah, what do so, you call that again? Yeah. So power phase, the second power phase goes like day 16 to about day 18, 19. And then the final one is nurture the nurture phase starting around day 20 you've got to nurture yourself and this is this is really important because i was going to originally call it the chill out phase but you could chill out on your on your couch and still have stress i want you to think of this time as you need to nurture you actively nurture yes. yourself yeah so go get a massage you know like i said like could you could you how do you cut cortisol down like what activities can you do during that week to nurture yourself if you do that you're going to find your pmf pms symptoms won't be as high and the day you start bleeding won't be as bad but because we're not nurturing ourselves during that week, during that, and for some people it's a week, some people it's three days, but during that time, and you're pl pl plowing right through that with all your stress, mm -hmm. this is throwing all hormones off. Okay, where are my gals that are struggling with hormonal imbalance? Bloated, feeling like you're not making progress with weight loss? You need to add these foods in so that you can support better hormonal health. There is a lifestyle that estrogen wants you to live, and there is a lifestyle that progesterone wants you to live.